You are God alone from before time began. We're going to go see him one day soon. And it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Amen. The, uh, the whole thought behind what uh, Brother Mike was sharing and looking at uh, what's happened to us when we got saved and many things, of course, if you want a wonderful study, um, well, first of all, you, hey, I need, to, I need to be discipled, I need to learn the Bible, well, that would be a great thing, you, you need to jump in on that, we, we would uh, love for you to learn more about what um, you say you know a little bit about as a Christian, but one of the great studies you can have is, hey, uh, what happened to me when I got saved? And all the things that go along with that. And, and of course, the justification that God uh, made you justified in Christ. The redemption, the fact that you are redeemed, that I am redeemed in Christ. That you have a new life in Christ. And we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning as we finish out our study in Matthew chapter number 7. The Sermon on the Mount. And look at how Jesus really just finishes out his sermon really, really strong. Remember as our study began back just a few weeks ago, and uh, it seems like it was just a little bit of time ago that we were getting off and, and started in, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 1 and looking at the recording of Jesus' very first preaching sermon in the Bible, and we saw right at the beginning uh, that he had a great following and from verse 25 of chapter 4 it says that multitudes were following him from Galilee and Decapolis and from Jerusalem from Judea from beyond the Jordan and then verse number 1 of chapter 5 seeing the multitudes he went up into the mountain and when he was set his disciples came unto him as well and so he has quite an audience and he's had quite an audience in that preaching setting as we have transported ourselves by the word of God by the Spirit of the living God to look into this passage. That's what we do, is we ask the Holy Spirit to, to teach us. That's his, uh, one of his pieces of his office that he holds as the third person in the Trinity. And, and so we learn from him according to his word. And today, again, as we finish out chapter number 7, we're going to look at the last few verses. Proof of a new life. You have a new life. That's one of the things that happened to you when you got saved. New life. You say, well, my life was changed a little bit. I, I got some changes going on. There's some things that are different. Um, I submit to you that if that's all that happened, you better take a little bit of an inventory of where you're at because it's a new life, the Bible says. And you have, you have experienced this new birth. Just as Nicodemus asked Jesus Christ, uh, Born again, born, born again, what do I have to do? Go back into my mother's womb and come back out again? And then, of course, he explains to him the spiritual birth, that you're born alive in Christ as a spirit birth, and now you're dead to yourself and you're alive in Christ. You say, well, how do we walk out through this whole thing and finish up? Well, we started out with the whole idea that this is my message, but it's his sermon. My hope is that even from the very beginning of this study that that's your approach to teaching the Bible. Yeah, that it's your message, yes, but it's his sermon. It's his work. It's his word. Uh, I often say that if you want to be a good preacher and a good teacher, just repeat what Jesus Christ said, and you'll do all right. I, I believe you'll, you'll hit a home run every time if you just teach the Bible, teach what the Bible says and do it properly, theologically sound, with doctrine. And so this morning as you think about what your new life is, reference back into the Sermon on the Mount. And how Jesus Christ told them that, hey, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. But he also preached and spoke about the kingdom of heaven. And unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes, the Pharisees, then you won't enter into the kingdom of heaven which of course then behooves the great doctrinal study and uh, uh, researching, going through, studying the Bible about dispensational truth, about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdoms of this world, and how you have to understand how this Bible is written. 
that you have to study to show yourself approved under God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, properly knowing what is being said. In the practical application of this Sermon on the Mount study, we've realized that last week we had to do a home inspection. I sure hope you did that. You spent some time not looking at your house and, and uh, criticizing all the dirtiness that's in there, but rather your vessel, the vessel that holds and is the home of the Holy Spirit of God, and that your heart is a new heart that has been changed by the new life in Christ. We looked at heaven and real world. We looked at proclaiming the Father's goodness. We had a lot of different messages that we looked at. But now, we're here at the end of our study. We're here at the end of our Sermon on the Mount study. And we're looking at verses 15 through 29. I'm going to put a question up for you. And then I'm going to come back to our passage. And we're going to read it through. But what has been your response to the Sermon on the Mount preached by Jesus Christ. I sure hope that you take the time. I, I've mentioned this in the past, and I, le- I said it maybe, I, I think it was Wednesday at our Bible study, I found a, uh, going through a lot of things, I've been going through a lot of stuff that I've saved, uh, I've been doing this for two or three years from, from teaching and preaching, but then being taught, going through Bible classes over many years, and then sitting where you're sitting, taking Bible notes, taking mess- message notes. I don't know how many of you still do that, but I found message notes from 1990, 91, 92, 93, year, for years up until, of course, when our family moved here, and 98 all the way <clears throat> until now when Brian Calloway preached just a few weeks ago, just sat right there and took notes when Brother Dwayne was preaching and, and I was not speaking that Sunday, uh, taking notes and writing things down. I sure hope you've been doing that, studying your Bible, looking up Bible verses. Today we're going to have a little bit of a, a walk through the Bible as we support some of the things that God has for us to learn through, again, the scriptures. The Bible teaches itself. Just let it do so. If you're wondering about that, just open up Psalm 119 and read that for a little while, and you understand that the Bible proclaims itself to be truth, and it reveals itself in its judgments and precepts precepts and commands and every single word. So, What has been your response to the Sermon on the Mount preached by Jesus Christ? Well, let's read these verses here, verses 15 through 29, and see what God has for us together, what he has for you personally as we study the Word of God this morning, again, in our last message on the Sermon on the Mount. Join me, verse number 15, follow along as I read through our text. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? So again, he is uh, doing something that he did, verses 13 and 14, two different places, two different ways. For God, he, he does this throughout the scriptures. God or the devil? The world or Jesus Christ? Yourself or a consecrated life in Jesus? Heaven, hell. On and on it goes. And so God shows us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus Christ is laying it all down. Hey, look, there is two ways to go here. I would have you that you choose the one that is me. That's what he's communicating on the Sermon on the Mount. And today we're going to see three different ones he talks about. That's an intro, of course, into this one because he talks about false prophets. And he leads into verse number 17, 18. 19 and 20 about fruit and how there's two different kinds of trees. The false prophet tree, the true prophet tree. Here we go. Verse 17 says, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not Good forth good fruit is hewn down, cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. So that's interesting that he has made sure and made it clear for us how you can know. Verse number 16 said again, ye shall know them by their fruits. It's important to see how you and I can distinguish between the false and the true. Verse number 21, he now presents to us two different uh, settings here when it comes to, hey, how you say that you are born again or you know the Lord 
and how you really are not, how there's, there's this, this, this uh, fake belief versus a real belief. So here's how he approaches this one in verse number 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Okay? So if you want to simply just tie that one together, here's one. But if any of you have ever studied the will of God, you know the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants people to repent of their lives, repent of the way they were going, and turn to him, call in the name of the Lord to be saved and receive the righteousness of Christ and have a changed life. But not everybody that says, Lord, Lord. I can address you and say, Lord, Lord. Well, even the devils, they know. But they, in their place, are not going to enter into the kingdom. They have never, ever bowed their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ or their heart but they know who he is. They even believe that he exists. Remember the scripture's teaching. It continues in verse number 22. Uh, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done wonderful works. People that are fakes have done that. They've been around for centuries. Verse 23 And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now verse 24 brings us two men. Foolish man, wise man. We're not going to sing the song, a wise man built his house upon the rock. The rains came down. But we understand that the foolish man built his house upon the sand. Two different houses. Two different approaches. Therefore, verse number 24, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and, in the, w- and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell, and, the, and great was the fall of it. What an awful statement. But the fall is so great as much as the stand is great when you stand upon the rock. Remember, David, King David wrote about his rock. The Lord is my rock and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The rock, he is my rock, my strong tower. Psalm 18, 2 Samuel chapter number 22. That's Jesus being personified and magnified by King David writing of him. Verse number 28 and 29. Look at how this finishes up. Came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, and he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. What has the Sermon on the Mount done for you to think through things? What has been your response? What has been your time in the Lord over our series and time in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, look at verse number 28 and 29. Maybe you're like that. I opened with this when we started a few weeks ago and said, hey, can you imagine this? That the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ is speaking to the Jewish audience. He is the one that they've been looking for. They, have all, they all know about him. The Pharisees, the scribes, they know that there's this coming king. It's Jesus Christ. They just didn't see him right before their eyes. They didn't recognize him because they didn't want him to come. And his preaching was strong. And this is hard preaching for them as religious people. And then at the end of his message here, he sa- they say, Hey, Jesus had ended his sayings that people were astonished at his doctrine. Why? Because doctrine came from all the awesome religious chief geniuses, excuse me, of the day, the the, the chief mucky mucks of the temple. They knew everything. And how we get a better explanation is the next verse when it says, For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. He taught doctrine. Hey, listen, if you don't like doctrine, you need to start liking it. Doctrine is so huge and so important in your new life in Christ. 
Right now, everyone, take out a sheet of paper. I want you to give me five verses that prove that you know that your salvation is eternally secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. Give me five references. I wonder how many people could do that. How many people could make a list for me of the things that God says in his Bible are the will of God? How many of you could say and prove to me that salvation is by the Lord Jesus Christ only, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship once we get saved, and it's by his grace. How many of you could prove that you have righteousness in the Lord Jesus Christ? How many of you could understand and tell me and show me from the scriptures what it means to have liberty in Christ, but understand how we're to be stewards of what God's given us? You see, this is hugely important in your new life in Christ doctrine. It's not the only thing, because the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God is probably for doctrine, but also reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. That you need all those pieces and parts, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Take a Bible Institute course. Get into discipleship one-to-one. Have somebody show you, teach you. Or if you're mature in the Lord and you've had a new life in Christ for 25 years, then why would you not say, hey, I'll disciple you? Well, how will we know if anybody could? Call the office. Stop by in the, out, in the, out in the lobby. Tell us you want to be. Now, I don't know. It's so hard to find out. Call the office. Text me. Everybody's got my phone number. You call me for a lot of crazy things. Send me an email. I don't care because you should know doctrine. So that when God reproofs you and corrects you and gives you instruction in righteousness, that he could perfect you. Hmm. Go to Romans chapter number 5 with me for a moment. Let me give you a simple little truth this morning that you've seen before, but let me reinforce something for our message. Now, you have a new life in Jesus Christ. You're a new creature in Christ. Again, not just changed. Well, you know, God changed some things, but yeah, I don't feel like I'm saved, or I don't know if I am. When you get to a point there where you don't feel, you better get in scriptures, get down on your knees, make an appointment, talk to Dr. Bobby, talk to, to Pastor Dwayne, give myself a call, whatever. We've got a thousand people on staff, and we don't know nothing, so then call some, one of our deacons. Call one of our, listen to me. People, you need to know what your new life in Christ look, ought to look like to other people and prove that you have a new life in Christ, and it starts with what you believe. Do you know really what you believe? Do you really know? Well, I, I, again, I've been saved for a while, Pastor. I, I know all that stuff. Do the people around you tell on you, and as the old phrase goes, if you were brought to a courtroom and there was a prosecuting attorney against you and a defense attorney, and there was enough proof to say, yes, I can bring in 200 witnesses and tell you that that person is a Christian, or would it be that there's no witnesses for you and me? You see, this morning, I want you just to see a couple things about your righteousness because it plays into, it walks right into, it's just, it's perfect. It's the Bible. Verse number one, chapter number six. Watch this. What shall we say then? You know, this is a precious chapter. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of you as baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now watch this, verse number four. What happens with this new life in Christ? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. We just sung a little song about that. We're just talking about that. You have a new life. You're baptized. You're immersed into Jesus Christ. You say, I know that. You ought to tell some people about it, or at least some people ought to learn from you that you have a new life, not just a different life, not just a goofy life, not just a little bit of changes here and there, that like as Christ, verse number four, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. This is your new life in Christ, right? You get this new life in Christ. Now, I just read that to do something. I do this often. Now, look back at the last verse of chapter number 5. Now, if you took 17, 18, 19, 20, we get into that place, we're talking about, hey, but is God coming in his love toward us in that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us? That 
things got going with this one man, which is Adam, but the one is Jesus Christ. And we understand that we have life in Christ. We have a brand new life, and we are justified, and we're made righteous. And of course, it says that in verse number 17, that we have the gift of righteousness in Jesus Christ by one. And it goes on, verse number 18, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift. You see this? The righteousness, the righteousness, the righteousness. Verse number 19, so by the obedience of one, Jesus Christ, shall many be made righteous. Here's verse 21. You can hang everything on this new life right here. You can fulfill. Listen, this world has been trying, this country has been trying to run out the Sermon on the Mount all over the world without converting anybody because it's a worldly thought. We can just do the Sermon on the Mount with everybody. We'll just live by the golden rule. We'll just, we'll just take a few billion, trillion, quadrillion millions of dollars and we'll convince everybody that we have the good life. I understand the idea of it all, but without people getting saved, there ain't nothing happening that's going to be righteousness. We just send more missionaries to countries so more people can get saved so that there's the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not this self-righteousness of man walking around saying, we fixed it all. We're so full of ourselves, and we've been full of ourselves since the garden. But by one Jesus Christ, his righteousness came. And so the Sermon on the Mount is a powerful message for you and me to show people they can never do it except for Jesus Christ. And that's how it comes across because Jesus is doing this to the Jews who believe in their own self-righteousness. So here's 21, chapter 5, verse 21 of Romans chapter number 5. But as sin hath reigned in the death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. You say that's just basic doctrine, Pastor. That's just basic. Do you really have any evidence, that kind of evidence that we've talked about? Jesus Christ is saying, hey, where is that righteousness? Well, those scribes and Pharisees thought they were the most righteous people in the whole wide world. They just stood up there and went, yeah, he, he did all right. He, he, he talked about some doctrine and he sounded like he had authority even greater than the scribes. I guess he did all right. He, he's a pretty good teacher. Yeah, and you crucified him. On their side, on earth, they thought they had won. Little did they know that God was using them to carry out his divine will for our righteousness to be, for his righteousness to be put upon us, to be imputed upon us. It says there in just a, just a verse that you know. You can, you can write down the, the address and, and be reminded of what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. It doesn't say anything about just a little bit of a change. It says there, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You say, I know that, I know that. I, then what's up? Jesus is doing it to us. Where's the proof? The proof to the religious people was that Jesus Christ was the righteous man in the, in the, uh, in the uh, whole setting, that the disciples were learning from Jesus on how to preach the message of his righteousness. He was teaching his disciples how you're going to have to break these guys down. I'm going to do the breaking down. And they're going to have to realize that the Mosaic law that they're trying to follow, this nice little sermon on the mount that they think they can do in their little half liberal, half kind of theology, there's no way that they're going to be able to do it without the theology of the Lord Jesus Christ, the truth of who he is in his death, burial, and resurrection. If you really want to see this world that you live in completely overhauled and changed, you and I need to have proof that we have new life in Christ and not just a kind of good life. I'll tell you this very simply. Recently, I went somewhere for a few minutes. I had to do something, and I got the great triad, the great three things. What were they? The three conversation pieces within 15, 20 minutes were dealing with the political aspect in the voting, uh, dealing with what uh, kind of health issues that I had and, and what I had, if I did have any, anything like that, how I was feeling. So how's my health? and then something completely directly having to do with the virus. And I thought, 
the person I was hanging out with is a believer. I've hung out with this person more than one time. And I thought, let's talk about Jesus Christ. Let's have a conversation of our new life in Christ. I got saved 37 years ago. Let's talk about that a little bit. I'm not saying anything mean. I'm not, don't, don't, don't take it that way. Don't, don't, don't be a baby. I'm just saying, what is wrong with the new life in Christ conversation? I like having those. I still enjoy having those. I like getting together with you a little while ago. Josh, thank you for the breakfast. I appreciate you finally buying me something. I, ho I hope that your wife didn't know that you bought me breakfast. But listen, we had a great talk. We talked about Bible, Bible stuff. All kind, it was just so good. That's a new life in Christ conversation. I love getting together with you, Chad. Right? We talk, listen, let's talk about our new life in Christ and how sweet it is and how good it is. And you're all silent. That's scary for a preacher. Yeah, I said it. It's scary for me. So just three simple things for you. Revival needs to come to us, everybody. It starts just personally. I know you need not look around to everybody else. I need to be in a place where my prayer life, my time with the Lord, everything. And the new life in Christ is something I cherish, the conversations. Coach, I love spending time with you on Mondays or whatever day just to talk about what God's doing in my life, in your life, in our lives, in our families. These are the conversations. Yeah, I saw you're the pastor guy. Oh, for goodness sakes. Shame on us. Our new life in Christ. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing, glory, a sinner has come home. They get excited. You know how pumped up I am, Bob, that I could baptize your son? That gets me excited. New life in Christ. These are the things that are, the peep, that's proof. That's proof. There's a million football games that will be played. A million baseball games. By the way, the Royals are back to being the Royals again. Praise the Lord. Everybody looks forward to the Chiefs season. Let's see our conversations. They're okay. Having those are good, but let's come back to our new life in Christ. Because there ought to be proof of new life. So we're just going to hunt over the Bible for the next few minutes. Let's watch this real quick. We'll just cover a few things in the next few minutes. Proof of life. I've highlighted verse number 20, uh, verse number 20 of chapter number 7. And it says in the text there, to be reminded that he talked of the false prophet... False prophet wears sheep's clothing, inwardly they're ravening wolves. Have you ever been around a wolf who's really hungry? They're ravening. They're ravished. They want to eat. I came up here last evening a little later on. There was four beautiful little deer. I took a picture. I didn't go shoot them. But I thought, what if there was some other kind of creature up here? They're going to go after them deer. Until they figure out that they can't catch the deer unless they really are fast. But that ravening wool wants to go after the sheep. And they dress like sheep. And they're false prophets. And they, 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 they can be seen by their fruit. So it says up there, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. So what does a false prophet do? False prophets, their fruit is deception. Jesus Christ said it about the devil himself, and he said it about the people that followed after the devil that were liars. You are of your father the devil in John chapter number 8. And the works of your father you do. He is a deceiver, he is evil, and he is wicked. And he can do it and mess with people because he gets in on. and Think about Judas, who walked with Jesus Christ for his earthly ministry, and at the end, he gave himself over. And the devil, it says in the Bible, grabbed a hold of his heart and he was off. Where's your new life? What's your new life look like? Well, a new life can pick out some things. Look at 2 John real quick. 2 John is between 1 and 3 John. Aren't I helpful? There you go. There you go. 2 John, verse number 9. What a great warning from Apostle John. 
It says, whosoever transgresseth. 2 John, verse number 9. And abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If they're come unto you, here's the warning. If they're come unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not unto your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Don't mess around with those that are false prophets. This is a practical teaching. I know that transports the, 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 the three letters of John here to where it's uh, tribulation stuff and, and millennial stuff, but just consider this, practically speaking. There are people that are really good at deception, and they look really, really good on the outside, and they have sheep's clothing. They're false prophets, but the true prophet, what's the true prophet do? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, just to your left. True prophets live life righteously, from Jesus Christ. Remember, we establish where your righteousness is. It's in Jesus, so you live righteously from Jesus. From him. From the point of your new birth, and your new life is filled with from Jesus. From Jesus. That's how you live. It says there, what kind of life will I live? This proof of a new life. Well, verse 5, chapter number 1 says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Jesus Christ, it was said, taught as a man with doctrine and authority. And the scribes, and that they look at him and go, Whoa, he has greater authority. What does it just say with Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica and saying, hey, we taught doctrine, the Holy Spirit of God confirmed it, and we are the witnesses of Jesus Christ. There is clarity, believer, in the church about who the false prophet are and who the true prophets are, and those that know will be able to bear witness there. Look at verse number 10 of chapter number 2. Ye are witnesses, church. And God also, how holily and justly and unblamably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. You will know them by their fruits. They will serve the holy God of the universe. They will truly know their doctrine. The Holy Spirit of God will bear witness of them. They will name the name of Jesus. That's how the true prophets will be able to show. Now you're the prophets Hey, church, you're the true prophets. You're the ones that are called by God to go. And you have all the prophecy you need that Jesus is coming again. And if you want to know anything else about what you can prophesy of, show everybody that I can prophesy you'll have a new life in Christ if you give your life to Christ. That's a simple little prophecy. I know by the Bible that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. I heard in the Bible that for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I know that if you put your complete faith in Jesus Christ, turn from your awful ways of sin, ask him to forgive you, and call on the name of the Lord to be saved, as it says in the scriptures, you will be saved. That's the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what true prophets go all about talk about, and there's a witness about them. The false prophets, they're full of deception. The next one, here's verse number 23 that I highlighted in the package of verses, again, that talk about those that say, Lord, Lord, but the Lord Jesus Christ says, I did not know you. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Hey, remember what it says in John? You don't have to go there, John. In John's Gospel, chapter number 10, Jesus Christ says, Hey, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Jesus Christ teaches that in him. So what do you got? You got a, a lot of people walking around thinking, oh, I called out, I, I made a, I, I did, uh, I can remember maybe something, uh, um, did you ever call in the name of the Lord to save you and really mean it? Or are you in a place where there's no proof of a new life? 
a few changes maybe, a few things that have kind of you know, changed things a little bit. Where's the new life proof? See, fake followers, their destiny is damnation. You can write that scripture down in Luke chapter number 13. I believe we have a minute. Go there, Luke 13 real quick. It's the, one of the counter passages of Jesus Christ preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. But this is a course and a, and a place where he's speaking to the Gentile audience. And you go in Luke 13. And if you've picked it up there in 23, 24, he talks about, uh, then said one unto him, Lord, are, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter at the straight gate. So you remember this type of uh, context and everything from Matthew's gospel. Lord, Lord, open unto us and he shall answer. You go a little further down. Verse number 26, Luke chapter 13. Then shall you begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not when ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Wow. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets of the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. Oh my. Oh my. Fake followers, your destiny, their destiny is damnation. It's hell for all of eternity. And when death and hell get cast in the lake of fire, that's the all eternity. That will be the second death. I wonder about fake followers. That's a, just a heavy burden on my heart. I wonder if that will be that type of day. But the real followers in that day, they won't face that white throne judgment of spending eternity apart from God in a godless lake of fire. Real followers live their life obediently like Jesus. We looked at Romans 6 here earlier for time. Go ahead and write that reference down. But really what he's saying there in Romans chapter number 6 is quite simple. He's saying, look, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. That's our, that was the uh, camp theme for the youth this year, and Brother Josh even preached about that a few weeks ago. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, ye become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Real followers live their life obediently like Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ obedient to? His Father in heaven. He came, he said, to do the Father's will. That was proof of the life that he had as God-man, as man-God, divinely. But he was also tempted in all points as we. And so we know that it was incredibly powerful to see the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lastly, the proof of a new life also comes in this area too as we finish out in Matthew chapter number 7 when he goes to the two different people, the wise man and the foolish man. Wise man built his house upon a rock. Foolish man built his house upon that sinking sand. That sand is all the false doctrine that you fall through when the rains come. I did a beautiful wedding yesterday for a young couple. I challenged them and I said, look, the one that put you together is the one that's going to keep you together. The one that's going to draw on you, you have to draw on to him. He's the one that's going to make you stronger. He's the one that you have to lean on. You need to know more about him and what he teaches. Even go through Ephesians 5 and a few verses. Walk ye as dear children of God as it starts out in Ephesians 5, and then goes into the whole idea between the church and Jesus Christ, the, the picture of the husband and the wife. And you say, hey, that's, just, that's good stuff. You just read then. What incredible doctrine it is. Because guess what? The proof of life is that you don't fall away. That when you build your house upon the rock, it fell not. But the great was the fall of it in verse 27, when you built upon sand. I said to that young couple, you better not build your life on everything right now seems so good. 
you got this beautiful little life. Everything is beautiful. It's wonderful. But if you've built it on sand, when that storm comes, and boy, it's coming. When the rain came down and the floods came up, it's coming. See, foolish builders, their life is desolation. Have you ever been anywhere where there has been a tornado, a hurricane, a flood? I tell you, there's some, just de- it's just desolate. It's like no one was there. The pathway of desolation is awful. That's what happens to the believer when we get to a place where we go, wait a minute, I become foolish. I'm a foolish person. I'm not building my house upon the rock. As I mentioned earlier, David referenced Jesus Christ. Go to, go to 1 Corinthians 3 and we'll tie it together here. Now we know 1 Corinthians 3 is Paul's teaching them about the church and everything of the church, but then he turns it from the church and building their foundation on Jesus. They, he goes to the personal part of our life in Christ, the foundation. You see, the rock is the foundation. That's what also came out of Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount. The foundation, the rock of the Lord. It's personal for you and me. But you know what it says up in Ephesians 4.14 about being children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine? That's what happens to us. And we get tossed to and fro instead of being able to stand. You and I need to stand on the Lord Jesus Christ because the rain comes. Guess what? Remember what rain is in the Bible. The rain is a place of judgment from God. Remember the flood. I heard it came. And God used the rain to bring a great judgment upon this earth and upon mankind. Remember, when rain comes, it's a way of God bringing trials to us and bringing troubles to us in a way to prove him. Because foolish builders, their life is all desolation. They're tossed to and fro. But the wise builder, they live their life faithfully in Jesus Christ. They live their life according to the way Jesus Christ would have them, which means they get into the Bible. They understand the word of God. They say, okay, I'm going to live on the sun of righteousness. I'm going to live in a life that's set upon the rock. It says in verse number 9 of 1 Corinthians 3, we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So he's speaking of the church, okay? He's speaking right there. We're not a Paul, Cephas, so doctrine. He's speaking of the church. Verse number 10, just as it goes into Ephesians 2. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. I, I planted this church. I was there for a bunch of months. And, and another built it thereupon. There's others that have come. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So the body of Christ, right? The different spiritual gifts, the different talents God gives. You have to take heed what part you do. Now here comes a really big part of this and how it transitions is something personal. For other foundation, verse number 11, can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The church is supposed to be built on the rock, Jesus Christ. But look at this personal stuff that comes in verse number 12, 13, 14, 15. Now if any man build upon the foundation... Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. That's not the white throne judgment, right? It's the judgment seat of Christ for the believer when you have the new life in Christ. What's the proof of your new life in Christ? Guess who's going to prove it? The Lord. And that day, he will judge it, the Father and the Son. And it says there, verse 14, if any man's work abide which he have built thereupon, he shall receive a a reward. Verse 15, this is a heartbreaker. This is a heavy-hearted verse in the Bible. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yes, so as by fire. It lines up with those kind of verses when Jesus says, you can't be my disciple if you love someone or something more than me. You have to hate your brother, your sister, your mother, everybody. Or you cannot be my disciple. I don't know. Those verses are, they're cutting. They're deeper than anything. And here's the word of God saying, you will be saved, but you're going to suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. What does that mean? We'll have to find out in eternity, won't we? We will. But even so, we will be saved as by fire. Wise builders live their life faithfully in Jesus. We truly have to look at what Jesus has taught us and say, what is this new life in Christ look like? 
What's the proof of a new life? Well, here you go. Here's our tie together at the end. A couple of questions for you as we enter in a time of prayer. Enter in our time of invitation. Proof of a new life in Christ. What does the Lord's judgment in our life prove to him? See, the Lord says, I'll put some things in your life. The Bible says he does not tempt us to sin, but blessed is the man that endureth temptation. He will bring things into our life, maybe a rainstorm. And when you're built upon the rock, you won't fall. You might get beat down and beat up and beat down and beat up, but you don't fall because you're on the rock. When you get to a place where you're going, I wonder if there's any proof in my life by the fruit they should know them. Lord God, prove me. Prove me to be faithful. Prove me to be the obedient man. What does the Lord's judgment in our life prove to him? Is it his new life or still our old? Please join me for a word of prayer as we go into our invitation time. Bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's talk to the Lord a little bit. Our Father in heaven, my, my heart toward you is one of complete and utter peace and joy in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I thank you to rejoice in the Lord always and again to rejoice. But also on the other side, my heart sometimes weighs heavy. So in the name of Jesus, as my heart weighs heavy over my own life and walking and what the proof of my life is in you, Jesus, I pray for our congregation. I pray for our church. I pray for all the believers. Even in John 6, it says that there were disciples that stopped following you. That breaks my heart. I pray, God, that you will revive your church, revive our hearts, revive our lives, and have us be in a place where there's proof of a new life in Jesus Christ. Lord God, have your way over the next minute or two in our invitation time, I pray in Jesus' name. Please stand.